uh, and put your marker in there. Uh, got a little bit of an introductory video to watch, just a couple minutes before we go and, and break this down verse by verse. So we'll give you a moment to get, to get situated here. Together watched something, Lord, that we're asking you now as we come to you first and then your word. Lord, that you will oversee everything that is necessary, that you will keep us safe in your presence in this place to hear what your spirit would say to us. And may we, Lord, even as the man in the account, respond in faith and hear what you would say and be directed by you. All that you desire, we ask, thanking you in faith for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So that particular video... uh, I believe was helpful because it it set a tone. Clearly something supernatural was going on and you would pick that up from reading the passage. But our challenge this morning is to see this particular portion of scripture not separate from what we looked at last Sunday. There the disciples are in the boat. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. This particular event happens as the boat gets to the other side. So what have they just been through? Well, they've just been through a supernatural event of their own, right? The storm and because of a lack of faith in coming to the Lord, well, the Lord, in his compassion on the disciples, rebuked the waves and the sea. And just reeling from that, Mark's account just says, Bam, immediately they're on the shore. And now this, or now this, what we're going to read. Um, So if you have your Bibles, let's uh, take a look here. And we'll just start breaking it down verse by verse as we go this morning. In Mark chapter 5, verse 1, we read, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. The other side. I want to take a moment and draw your attention. If you scan back a few verses to chapter 4, verse 35, you see Jesus' command in the episode prior when they're getting into the boat. Let us go to the other side. Now, we need to think like they certainly could have been thinking and I think likely would have been thinking if they were Bible believers. In the back of your Bibles, there are Bible maps of the area of Israel, right? And some of them feature quite prominently the Sea of Galilee, where the event that we're reading happened, and the River Jordan. So briefly, the River Jordan has its beginning at the base of Mount Hermon, the the snow melt and every other tributary that uh, flows into it. Then it goes south, to the Sea of Galilee, flows through the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River continues and terminates in the Dead Sea. Now the significance for this morning of all of this is the River Jordan and the Sea of Galilee represent the border of Israel. What's significant about that? Well, the Lord had told the Israelites that he, the Lord, had chosen one nation among all the other nations that he, the Lord, would be their God. And the other nations have other gods. The Israelites knew. Scripture shows us clearly that it's God who governs over the people Israel and the area that he assigned to them, whether the Israelites were obedient or Rebellious. So many Old Testament passages where the neighboring countries would come against Israel, suffer a tremendous defeat, and realize it was because Israel's God was defending them. So, when Jesus said to the disciples back here in chapter 4, let us go to the other side... There's the occasion for them to think not only, hey, we're just going to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is like a large lake, nowhere near as large as, well, Lake Erie and our Great Lakes here. I mean, you can see across it. For a kid from Minnesota, it's a big lake. But it's, you can see the other side. Now, the other side meaning not only the other side of the lake, but 
The other side is, that's not our side, that's their side. They're the people that live there and the gods, the spirits that rule over them. So they're standing someplace when Jesus says, let's go over to the other side on Israel's side, on the western shore. Once you get off the boat, because the lake is the border, it's attached to the sea, you're outside the boundaries of Israel. You're subject to whatever action that territorial spiritual God takes against you. It's likely, it's certainly possible, that this might also have contributed to the disciples' fear as they were crossing over in the boat. A couple things that we could find biblical support for. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. Okay, it's, we're talking geography, but now what if they're thinking, but wait a minute, we don't have Yahweh's protection over there. That's the non-Israelites, the Gentiles. We're going over there. And then on the way, these seasoned fishermen and others see something that was beyond their experience, something supernatural in terms of a storm. What if they were good Bible readers? Hey, what if they remembered the account of Job? And Satan, by God's allowance, was allowed to use wind and storm to cause his afflictions. Certainly they were terrified, so much so that they came to Jesus as we looked at last week. And then, still reeling, I imagine, from that experience as they step off, they're now on the other side. And I think that Jesus is showing them, and even more importantly us today, his superiority over the other God and gods that rule the areas that you and I live in today. So let's pick it back up here in Mark chapter 5 when we read in verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gadarenes. Different translations, different accounts in the Gospels. There's a parallel account in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8. Sometimes we see this as the Gadarenes, sometimes the Gergesenes, Gadara or, or Gadara or Gersa. Well, they're very similar sounding names for the same place, depending on who is doing the writing and what area. Basically, if you stood in Capernaum and you looked across the Sea of Galilee, you'd be able to see the region where this happened. You'd stand right on the border of, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's country, and you'd look over to the land ruled by God's allowance by the other gods. And so this area is pretty specifically mentioned, and we read, verse 2, and when he, speaking of Jesus, had come out of the boat, immediately there met him a man of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, let's just think about what's certainly a Bible-believing Israelite would have known about where they're now standing. This is as unclean as unclean could get. We're outside the boundaries of Israel. We're amongst the Gentiles, the goyim, the nations who are not favored as they referred to them. Tombs? Oh yeah, there was something in the law of Moses for the Israelites there. You know, if you touched a dead body or even oh, as much as the graves, you would be defiled for a ceremonial period of time. So, I mean, there's just point after point where if you were honoring God, you would avoid this area. And then, well, strike three, if you will. Here comes a demon-possessed man. And more specifically, and I think appropriately, a man with an unclean spirit. Your subtitles probably say something like, mine does the gathering demoniac, a guy who is suffering demonic possession. What we know for certain from Scripture is the demons were unclean, meaning spirits that were in rebellion to God. What we know from, well, extra-biblical writings, historical writings, and what, well, the Israelites believed, and the church for the first several centuries, was that, this particular spirit 
was different from what we would describe as a fallen angel. Angels can take on physical form. They touch people. They eat. But these unclean spirits that are referred to as demons in our English translation, they're spiritual beings, but they're always looking for a body. What the Hebrews believed was they were the spirits of the Nephilim that perished in the judgment. Now as, well, non-corporeal, right? Spirits without a body, they looked for a body that they could find. And Jesus taught about them. No matter where you are on their origins, they are spirits opposed to the things of God and the people that God loves. Here called an unclean spirit in verse 2. Speaking of, well, this man who had an unclean spirit, more on the word an, <laughs> he certainly had an, right? Who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Wow, a lot going on there, so let's break it down a little bit finer. Quick bits of essential information on demonic possession so our thinking might be lined up with the Lord. It's becoming well, vogue in Hollywood movies and in headlines and other sources to refer to demonic possessions. Oh, this person's acting weird and I think they've got a demon. Well, maybe, but how do you know? Well, biblically, there's always two signs of when it's true demonic possession. Supernatural strength, this guy had it. He's breaking chains and shackles. No one could tame him, couldn't keep him confined, and supernatural knowledge said to Jesus, I know who you are. And in other places, we see that also, the Holy One of God immediately, right? Now, there's some more interesting things here. This particular man, well, we're told he was the recipient of Self-harm, as we like to say. He was cutting himself. Do we see that anywhere else in Scripture where people are, are involved with other supernatural beings? And Well, yeah, how about Elijah and the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel? You remember that Elijah famously challenges them, the God who answers by fire? Well, he's God, so the priests go first and they stack up the sacrifice and they're hooting and hollering and jumping and cutting themselves, literally, and nothing. But it's interesting, the, the, the cutting, the, the self-harm. And, well, here's a man who is also the recipient of some cutting. It doesn't seem like a formalized religious worship, but we're going to see the spiritual nature of it here in a few more moments. Something else that's interesting to note about demonic possession. Jesus has just gotten out of the boat and immediately this guy. Now, if we compare this account to the account written in Matthew, well, there's two men actually afflicted by this, but Mark, by the Lord's leading, chooses to focus on one. And I think we have some reasons to understand why that might be that we'll talk about. Since Mark just focuses on the one man, that's where we're going to be focused today. Jesus is out of the boat, and the man immediately runs. The demon-possessed man runs to Jesus. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. The word worship means like literally it's, it's a physical posture to bow down, to prostrate yourself before, associated with worship. Now you got to ask yourself, who's doing the running and the worshiping? The demons or is it the man? 
technically in demonic worship, you have at least two beings in one body. Is it the man who also noticed and sensed that here's the help and he ran? That's what I think, but I can't be certain enough to say so. We don't see an account of demons worshiping voluntarily. But what we do see is the demon certainly taking over the vocal apparatus because it's the demon speaking here. And that would be consistent with our understanding of an unclean spirit. The last thing they're going to want to do is to allow anyone to come to Jesus to know the freedom and restoration that's only available in Jesus. Maybe the man had an opportunity where he was in control and ran to the Lord and prostrated himself. But as that happens, well, the demon is speaking in verse 7. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? Demons know the score. You and I were on different teams. What have I to do with you? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. It's interesting to me to note that Satan and his uh, co-workers, that's how we're kind of led to believe, to think about the rebellious angels and the demon. They're all opposed to God. They've got different jobs and descriptions here, but they're all, well, they're all opposed to the Lord. But none of them are opposed to using the things of God towards their ends, right? So I'm going to bind I'm going to bind Jesus by an oath and get him to do my will. You know, well, good luck with that here. In verse 8, we read that Jesus had said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Now, if you look at that carefully, the sequence of this seems to indicate that Jesus first says, Jesus knowing the guy's possessed as he runs towards him, and Jesus says, come out of him. And you're thinking, but wait a minute. Did he not come out of him? Well, we're going to find out in a little bit that there's a lot of them to choose from. They didn't all come out, obviously, because now they're speaking, right? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, verse 8, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, what is your name? Okay, and there's a, a... interesting and long study about naming and the relationship of authority in all of these things, right? The demon, I believe, being compelled to answer gives him one. He answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Legion, as we see it in scripture in the English, we see it used a couple different ways. Referred to angels, Right? When Jesus is telling the disciples not to resist as his arrest, you not know that I could call on my father and he would send 12 legions of angels. Legions as a number of Roman soldiers. And the number is, is kind of helpful, but it depends what period of time you're getting the number of legions. Anywhere from three to 6,000 are the numbers that I've read, depending on the time. So if you, if you wanted to use a round number that's possible, We could be talking about 5,000 here. It was always in the multiples of thousands when the reference of legions is used. And that really makes you wonder, doesn't it? How many of them were in him? The thing about spirit is they don't take much room, if you will. They're not bound by our conception of space. Possession is more a matter of relationship than, than geography. But he answers Jesus, it's recorded for us, my name is Legion, for we are many. There's a lot of us in here. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. As I said earlier, demons, as they're recorded in Scripture, they know the score. They know that Jesus is in authority. They know that they are ultimately subject to his will. Oh, that the church would realize what the demons realize. They can't do anything without God's allowance. In another place, we see the demons responding when they ask him the question, have you come to torment us before the time? That tells us they know that their judgment is sure, and it's just a question of when. 
that concept has caused many scholars to, well, to imagine that what Satan's end game is is to postpone this as long as possible. You see biblical support for that perhaps in Daniel when we're told of the Antichrist that he will seek to change times and laws. Could be. But they know God's allowing them to be free before that time. And they know it'll be the time of God's choosing when their judgment comes. So they're begging them in verse 10, don't send them out of the country. Why? Because if Jesus says go, you got to go. That's how it works with demons. We're told in verse 11, now a large herd of swine, pigs, was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. Again, from the Israelites' perspective, pigs? No, no, that's, that's unclean animal. That's one of the things that separated them. Nothing's unclean to a demon. And there's a lot there, I'm sure. And it, it always makes me wonder when I, when I see the pig reference. The Lord chose the pigs for the separation of Israel. And we see so much today with the human animal intermingling with, well, pigs are the natural host animal. I don't want to make much of that. There may be nothing there, but there were pigs and a lot of them. And the demons apparently thought, hey, better to be in somebody than nobody, even if it's the body of an animal or a pig. So they asked permission. Send us over there. And at once in verse 13, Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about 2,000. So between that clear biblical reference and the reference to legion, it really makes you wonder how many demons were there. And the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. We're just told what happens. We're not told why. Were the, the demons set to destroy the pigs? I, I don't think so. The pigs probably responded in this new reality and the demons didn't have enough control. We can only guess at that. That seems more consistent with what Scripture tells us about possession. Sometimes it's the demons running the show. Sometimes it's the people. It's not a perfect mix. What is significant for us now is, well, think about this. Jesus and disciples have just crossed over. The picture of light entering the darkness. Darkness symbolically, the Gentile world. Now, message, demonstration of Jesus, the Son of God, the Word of God is there. How are they going to respond? Well, let's remind ourselves of what Scripture has told us. Before the whole boat incident, maybe they were there thinking, wow, that's an unusual storm. Look, there's boats out there. I don't know. But it was probably just another day for these guys. They're Gentiles. They've got 2,000 pigs. That's a lot of pigs. And ultimately, they're raising them for the same reason anybody else raises livestock, right? Food or money if you do it for profit. There's a lot of material gain there. 2,000 pigs, and these pig herders, they just saw all 2,000 drowned in the sea. I mean, if you just think about that, that's a lot of pork in the Sea of Galilee. You wonder about the after effects of those things washing about. But in just a moment, as a result of the interaction with Jesus, a good chunk of their livelihood, if not all of it, is now gone. How do you respond to that? You know, we're looking for applications and we're going to see them, but Scripture always gives us an opportunity to see in others what we're going to experience ourselves when it comes to Jesus. Jesus came over with his disciples. Jesus, who famously said to his disciples and those who will be and us, hey, unless you forsake all that you have, you can't be my disciple. 
That's just the cost. Anything unclean, and that's got to go. I won't take any good thing from you. Well, what a picture. 2,000 pigs, that's a lot of money in worldly value. There's Jesus. He just set that guy free, and everybody knew about that guy. Scripture confirms it. No one could tame him. No one could bind him. And now, he's different. Faced with, oh, oh, a livelihood and a miracle happened and a man was delivered, a human life was saved. Where do you go? Well, we saw and we're going to read their reaction. Verse 14, those who fed the swine fled. They told it in the city and in the country and they went out to see what it was that happened. So first the report, hey, an, um, an amazing supernatural event. Then they came to Jesus, those who kept the pigs, and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting, clothed, and in his right mind, and they were afraid. A normal response to a supernatural event. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him and who had been demon-possessed and about the swine, they break it down for him. Oh, here's the deal. It was demons. You know, they rule over all of here, but Jesus has come. He's greater. He's delivered this man, and there's a message of hope for everybody. And I don't know exactly what they told him, but they had some understanding. They were able to say, oh, the power of God has come amongst us, and now time to choose sides, if you will. Verse 17 then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat, isn't that interesting? Jesus left. You don't want anything to do with me? I'll go. I won't impose myself on you. What did that group of pig people do? Well, they did some economic calculations. It's going to cost everything that I love in this world to follow him. No, I would rather have the world, thank you much. Why don't you just go maybe back to your side? I'm happy to stay on this side. Jesus is leaving. Verse 18 again, when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him, that he might be with him. Not all the people were of the same affection. The guy who had just been delivered. Now here's the time where we can talk about it. Matthew's account says there were two guys. But it seems as though Mark only focuses on the guy who was interested in following Jesus. How typical that is of so many situations in Scripture when Jesus is amongst people, when miracles are being done when the kingdom of light and life is being, well, announced, demonstrated, people are being set free from spiritual bondage. Some follow, some don't. Here it was two guys. That's a lot like when Jesus was crucified between two criminals. One called out to him. One mocked and wanted nothing to do with him. We don't know what happened to the other demon-possessed guy. But we know that one of them, this one, came and said, I will follow you. Now, as you've probably read this before, you think, oh, right on, right? We all have this basic understanding from Scripture that the multitudes are going to refuse the Lord. It's sad, it's tragic, but it's true. But one, Man, whether it be a Samaritan woman as well, just one. Jesus would come for one. We say that so often. And when you get the one, of course Jesus wants him to follow him. Right? Hmm. Let's look at the response. Verse 19. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. What's happening? Well, we're in that time of Scripture when the gospel, as we read in Mark, the good news of Jesus and the kingdom of God is being announced. But what do we also know from Scripture? The gospel goes out first to the Jewish people. 
As Jesus traveled around and announced and preached and proclaimed in that area, it wasn't a very big swath. But as he told the Syrophoenician woman, I've come only for the lost sheep of Israel. However, many of the Gentiles heard it. So when Jesus tells this man, first of all, we recognize Jesus said, you go to your people. There's a distinction. This man is not a Jewish man. That's why he's hanging over on the other side, right, with the people who keep the pigs. And they're, they're not subject to any of those provisions, but he's been set free. The kingdom of God, the power of God has happened. And Jesus says, you go and tell your people the places where Jesus would not yet go this man is being used to announce to the Gentiles. Specifically, look at verse 20. And he, the formerly possessed man, departed. He's obedient. This is great. Began to proclaim in Decapolis. What's Decapolis? Or where's Decapolis? Decapolis is a term for an area containing 10 cities, right? The, the prefix D-E-C, dec or deca, meaning 10, and polis always means a city. We get that here. You know, Indian Apolis. Well, a polis city in Indiana, Minneapolis, a city in Minnesota. Well, the Decapolis, a region of 10 cities in Gentile territory. And now the message is going out. Hey, I was, I was that guy. God had compassion. Jesus set me free and then sent me to tell you about the great things that God had done for them. It's fascinating and I think helpful to realize that what just transpired after the storm on the lake seems to be a further explanation to the disciples' question. Even the wind and the sea obeys this guy. Who can he be? Well, he's the God who has authority over all creation and all areas, even the Gentile areas. This formerly demon-possessed man, he hadn't had a fraction of the exposure and the teaching that the disciples had. Remember the, the message before this? Jesus is teaching parables. People are confused. The disciples get private explanation. But here this demon-possessed man with one truth and one command, he's going out and he's being used in a mighty way while the disciples are still, well, they're going to get a lot of training yet to come, years worth, but to the same end ultimately. Go out and tell others about the things that God has done for you how he's had compassion on you? Is it really any different for us today? Something to think about. Well, in order for us to have a testimony like that, you, you gotta have God deliver you from something, right? And I think that makes us a little bit more like the disciples in more ways than either we're aware of, or if we would choose to admit it. See, because there's two groups that we as Christians can identify with. Well, there's the, the guy who was delivered, if we understand it, and I want to tell people about Jesus, but there's the, the Gergesenes. Hey, this hanging with Jesus and having him in control is going to cost me things in the world. And, and, and don't pat ourselves on the back yet. We're thinking, well, I'm no pig farmer here. I don't, I don't have to worry about this. No, the pigs are a picture of things that the world holds dear but are opposed to the Lord. And in that, we might have this tendency to think about, you know, this passage is just one of the passages that always gets my attention and it's just so fascinating, it is, because we see supernatural things, but there's not a direct relationship, is there, right? I mean, this guy was demon-possessed, and he was doing these supernatural things, and I don't think anybody here has been demon-possessed, and some of us, most of us, are Christians, and, well, Christians really can't be demon-possessed, so we don't really 
have to worry about anything here. We'll just take that little bit of information that we got about how we can tell if somebody's really demonically possessed, supernaturally not, uh, supernatural knowledge, superhuman strength, and we'll be able to use that as we go forward. There's a bigger and essential message here for everybody that applies just as much to the disciples who were still wondering, who can this guy be? It wasn't just about delivering that demon-possessed man. It was certainly about that. It wasn't just about getting the message to the Gentiles in that area. It was about that. But it was also the continued training of the disciples. What did they see? Well, they should have seen what we can see is that Jesus' desire is not that anyone should be in bondage to evil spiritual being. Can I say it another way? Jesus wants us to be free. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. We'll put a couple scriptures on the screen in Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. God is expressing his desire to his people, Israel. If you can look beyond the word fast for a moment, because these people were involved in religious practices. Nothing wrong with that, but it was just empty for them. And God, through Isaiah, is correcting them when he asks them the question, is this not the fast that I have chosen, God speaking, to loose or loosen the bonds of wickedness? Park there for a moment. The bonds of wickedness. As we start to think about this, does this just mean when a demon's got you? Well, it does mean that, obviously. But is that what it's limited to? Who is God speaking to? A bunch of demon-possessed people? Or his people, Israel? Is this not the fast that I've chosen to loose or loosen the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break a few of the yokes? No, we're not talking eggs. Yoke, that implement of, of tying two beasts of burden together, that you break everything, everything that's holding you back. God says, I would have it to be gone. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, we can see that God's desire is for people to be free. It extended even to the Israelite. But is it just there? How about in the Gospel of John, the eighth chapter, again, God speaking to Israel, Jesus among the Pharisees. You know, we've never been in bondage to anyone. Anyone. We're Abraham's children. All those good things they said. Well, Jesus responds in the midst of the conversation in chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. So at this point, you know we're aiming for some application. And we might be wondering, could this possibly be us? Anybody here ever commit a sin? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're in one of two groups. You're either in the group that knows it or you're in the group that doesn't because the big group is everybody has sinned, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let's ask ourselves the question because, you know, the question that really matters is, is somehow this talking to me this morning Everyone who commits sin is a slave. Not has been, is. Please focus on that. Whoever commits sin is a slave. Very important for our understanding. So let's ask the question, what is sin? Biblically speaking, in Romans chapter 14, verse 23... Here's a passage where we use a lot, but here's been my observation. People will not respond to this until, well, certain criteria have been met. But nonetheless, let's look and see what God says. In the midst of a greater teaching point, a principle 
that can stand alone is revealed. And we read, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats. He's talking about, oh, should I eat, should I not eat? Because he who does not eat from faith. Here comes the principle, for whatever is not from faith is sin. What do we mean by faith? That's the response in trust to the revealed will of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hey, if this is contrary to what the Lord has told me to do, it's a bad idea. No. It's sin. Whatever. No. Part of it's just we're looking, hey, what, how do we break this down in the original Greek? I encourage you to check it out. It's a pretty clear Translation, whatever is not from faith is sin. You can go all the way back to the garden, one commandment. Everything was very good. One thing you don't do, eat from the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One thing, right? And, well, they did. Adam knew better. He sinned and Eve followed into it. Oh, one thing. You see, in God's perfect creation, which this will become again, everything is going to function according to God's instruction. And when anything goes contrary, sin happens and the corruption happens as a result. It wasn't just then, and it's not just the way it will be, it's right now. When we wonder why the world is the way it is, why the headlines read the way they do, it's because people are not following God's word. That simple. I saw a headline this morning before our meeting that just two blocks from here over on Consol Street, two people were shot to death, right? Right here, right where we meet. Well, something we need to understand about this. As we think about sin and captivity, let's look together and turn to one passage. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to start in on verse 24, but I, I want to encourage you to, to read carefully and study and compare spiritual things to spiritual things to find out because we're given some instructions first from Paul to Timothy but then it explains anyone who would be a bondservant a slave to the Lord a slave because they love the Lord we'll pick it up here in verse 23 second Tim verse 2 verse 23 Paul tells Timothy avoid foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife that's not God's plan right Think about this in terms of Mark chapter 5. Hey, we want you to get in the boat and go. Okay, you're going to get it your way. And a servant, the word is literally a slave of the Lord, must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Gentle is a fruit of the Spirit. Able to teach and patient, also a fruit. In humility correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance the change of mind that leads to that person acknowledging the rule of God in their life that's what repentance is so that they may know the truth step one step one is you got to know the truth right it, it comes with well the truth Jesus said sanctify them by your truth your word is truth so once you know the truth, then what happens? Potentially, if God grants it, verse 26, that they may come to their senses. Kind of sounds like the, the demon-possessed guy. But we're not talking to demon-possessed people here. But look what the Lord says to Timothy. Escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Now, the challenge here is to determine who is this talking to? Is this talking to the, you know, the Gadarenes, the Gentile people, everybody who doesn't know the Lord? Well, who's it written to? Timothy, 
but it's talking about other people. And you see the words like any, all, the brethren, whoever, right? Unbelievers certainly, but not limited to unbelievers. You know, Christians. Where do most good religious arguments happen? In churches, before they split and make other denominations. Right? Wow, who's behind that? It's a tactic of Satan to bring people, even believers, under his influence, into captivity, in bondage. Remember what Jesus said we just looked at in the Gospel of John? Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. When we understand that, we understand why the old nature had to be done away with and was... Christians who are studying this in depth, the spiritual growth study Friday nights, was done away with on the cross with Jesus because there's no rehabilitating the old nature. It's not me with a little bit of help. Now I can do good things. That's something Satan wants the church to believe. And for everyone who does, you've been taken captive by him. The remedy is the truth and God granting repentance to it. God did away with the old man in part because whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And then he gave to the Christian a new nature. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Behold, old things have passed away. New things have come. The new nature has not committed sin because it cannot sin, as we've learned in 1 John. That's why, Christian, you right now well, you're walking in the spirit, the new creation, or the flesh, the old man. The old man is and always will be Satan's foil, tool, captive. When we walk in the flesh, you're walking in his territory, under his control. But when you walk in the spirit, the new man who has never sinned, cannot be sinned. No, he's, he's only captive to the Lord Jesus. That's why scripture tells us that we should present our members to him, become slaves of righteousness, right? There it is. So how does this break down for us a little bit? Well... It's not about us going to the other side of the lake. Brothers and sisters, if you haven't realized it already, you live on the other side. It's all the other side. I just shared with you about what happened a couple blocks from here. You see the headlines, and we think, well, we can find a nicer area. It doesn't matter where. It's all the other side. It's all under Satan's control. That idea that you can make it better, we can improve, we can find a better area, that's part of the deception. Far better to have our eyes opened to this and to understand there's a lot of captivity. There's something else interesting to me about the account in Mark. That guy was demon-possessed a while. Jesus didn't make this job one in his public ministry. He was teaching other people and doing other things on that lake. It was just a couple hour boat ride over there. God will let us stew in our captivity quite some time, and I believe the revealed purpose is so we might know something of the tyranny of sin and, well, Satan's realm. But when we are prepared, well, then the opportunity to walk in the freedom and the newness of life. In closing, I don't think anybody here has been demon-possessed. But the potential is we can be in spiritual bondage. It doesn't look like you being in shackles and uh, breaking them and cutting yourself, although cutting and that kind of self-harm is quite common, right, in people who walk in the flesh. But there's another cap kind of captivity. And people often wonder, 
You know, we don't see a lot of demon possession like it was in the Gospels, even though there's a lot of Hollywood stuff. And when you think about the unclean spirits, Satan and his angels, all of them opposed to God, it kind of follows that Satan knows, like, you know, if you manifest evil and make it obvious, people who have the potential to know the difference might see that and respond. The best way to take people and God's people into captivity is make it look like a good thing. Oh, sure, make a few movies where a girl, you know, head spins around and she vomits out the green stuff, and that's evil. As long as that's not happening, we're good. No, Satan's biggest technique is deception. What did Jesus warn the disciples about at the beginning when they asked him about his teaching on end times? When they asked him, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus responded first, take heed that no man deceives you. Satan, among the other things, is described as a deceiver. People are led into bondage by the captivity of their thinking. Christians grow by having that changed. We're transformed by the renewing of our mind, the entrance of the truth and the response in faith. What does satanic captivity look like in the church? It looks like this. The Lord through someone is teaching his word. And people, Christians are hearing his word and some go, oh man, right on. And some go, well, I don't think that's it or that's just, well, yeah, I know that. But I think that's captivity. That's working on the other side. The Holy Spirit and Jesus and the Father never have that conversation. The Father says this, and the Holy Spirit says, nah, I, I don't agree with that. But when that happens with a Christian, when that happens with God's people, well, the Holy Spirit put it this way. <clears throat> Satan gets a foothold amongst us. There's the captivity that continues until people respond to the truth. In order to do that, well, you have to know the truth. You have to recognize your need for it. Apparently, the demon-possessed guy knew he had his need. Apparently, the disciples, those chosen by the Lord, were a little slower in the study. It sure seems like we can relate more easily to the 12 guys in the boat than the demon-possessed guy on the shore at times. But from this moment on, Choice is ours. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to meet here with you, to, to study your word, Lord, to see in this picture your heart revealed. You don't desire anyone to be in captivity. Father, I pray as the psalmist wrote that you would search us, you would try us, you would examine us to see if there be any wicked way, any place where we have given Satan a foothold. Lord, if there's anything that we know and we even hear the Holy Spirit in his gentle way right now saying, what about this? Where we don't want to face it, we don't want to hear what you have to say. But you being the Lord of our life, not part-time but full-time, if we're willing to walk away from the things, Lord, that you've shown us are of the world to respond to the fullness of the things that are of you, Lord, could we... By your working, please see them for what they are. As much captivity as that demon-possessed guy. Father, I saw so much torment in that man. And it just speaks to me, Lord, of what you wrote in Romans chapter 7. The plight of the Christian who has known the truth and not responded to it. The good things that I want to do, I do not do. But the evil that I hate, that I practice. Our brother Paul cried out in that situation, who will deliver me from this body of death? And Lord, you recorded for all of us. I thank God through Jesus Christ, his son. Lord, may we understand as quickly as possible the perils of turning away from your truth. May we understand, Lord, that anything in our flesh, our self apart from you can only be a captive of sin and the God of this world. 
Father, may you have your perfect way. May we stand with our focus upon you with hearts prepared, Lord, to receive and to rejoice in that which you've chosen to communicate to us in this last song. It's for your glory that we ask and give thanks in faith, in Jesus' name. Amen? Shall we stand and sing praises?